Tonight I'm going to speak on a subject that I rarely speak on. Something that's actually rarely taught on, spoke about in this church. We're going to discuss giving tonight. Other than during the missions conference, I don't suppose I have spoken specifically on giving probably a half dozen times in the time that I've been here. It's not because I don't believe in giving. I am what I would say more than a firm believer in giving. I'm also, just so you know, I'm not speaking tonight because there, we have a need. In fact, the exact opposite is true. Our financial position at the church is very strong. The Lord has been extremely good to us. Yeah. Our faith promise giving is such that uh, in the next week or two, whenever we get a chance to, we're going to bring some very heavy projects to you that we are recommending that we fund and vote on out of Faith Promise. So Faith Promise is doing extremely well as well. So it's not from a need that we're speaking on this. I also don't speak or not speak on a subject because of pressure from either side. In the past, several times when finances were just a little bit rough in the church, uh, I was encouraged that maybe some speaking on giving would be a good idea. I didn't take that suggestion. That's not how these things go. We also had a visitor, oh, I suppose it's been five or six years ago, uh, who accused us of being all about money. I thought that was really strange because I didn't speak on giving that day, and we didn't, nobody said anything about giving. I'm guessing that it was because the offering plate got passed around that that was either convicting or whatever, but uh, they were, we were supposedly all about money. That did not discourage me from speaking on the subject. Pressure from either side doesn't affect the way I, the messages go. I don't speak on it little because I think it's unimportant. In fact, I believe that proper giving is extremely important in the life of a believer. And those who don't participate or who are grudgingly giving or stingy in their giving are missing out on one of the true great joys of life. That's what I actually believe. If you are not participating in giving, you are missing something. Some churches preach heavily and often on giving. Not for the sake of people's growth, but because the church needs money. Uh, when A.W. Tozer was confronted with this, he said, Let all the other churches grab for money. I'll take the people instead. He said, if you get the people, they'll have, the fish will have a coin in his mouth. <laughs> so that is the truth. We, we speak on it for your growth, not because the church is, has some need for money. The only reason I know of that we are discussing giving tonight is because I believe this is where the Lord would have us be tonight, and that's why we are discussing it. Now, just so you know, I don't plan on saying anything new I don't plan on saying anything original, and I don't plan on saying anything that you don't already know if you've been in church for any length of time. But I don't want this to be the conclusion of the whole matter. I want it to be an introduction. I want it to be the, the beginning of a discussion that you and the Lord have together in the years, the weeks, years, months, days, all that ahead. I want this to be a starting point for you moving forward, not that we're going to keep speaking on it, but that you can talk with the Lord about this and go on a journey with him in this. Now, we're going to read from two passages of Scripture that are almost identical, and then we're going to squeeze them as hard as we can to learn from them. And we're going to refrain from jumping to any other passage of Scripture tonight. There's lots of passages that we could go to, but we're just going to let these two passages that are almost identical, they're very simple, speak for themselves. So we're in Mark chapter number 12, verse number 41. Most of you already figured this out. Mark chapter number 12, verse number 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury... And beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. 
For all they did cast in of their abundance, and she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Okay, now turn over to the book of Luke, chapter number 21. And we're going to read almost the exact same words here. Verse number 1. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have their, of their abundance cast in unto the offering of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. got a kind of a strange title here for you, but you'll understand it at the end. Enough faith to give two cents. Enough faith to give two cents. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name. Lord, so many people, so many churches have abused this topic. But Lord, it is a blessed topic. Such a help to your people. And we ask that tonight you would guide us carefully, guide our minds and our wills carefully into this all-important truth. I ask that you would help your people get a new vision, a new understanding, and a new love of giving. Lord, do a work for your people tonight. For we ask this in the precious name of Christ. We're just going to try to lay out the points as they are clearly seen in this passage tonight. We have two accounts of the same story, which are almost identical, which leads us to believe that this was basically the sum total of, of the, the event that took place. In other words, if you can get your mind into the scene here and see the scene as it actually is, you will know exactly and learn exactly what was supposed to be learned. There aren't any other words, evidently, that were this just was, this is it. This is all there was to this. This one thing, the Lord didn't make any more comments after this. This was all there was to this. And we can learn exactly what they were supposed to learn, just as if you were standing there at the time watching this take place. It's not a super involved story, so the, the, the points are pretty basic. Number one, not everyone has the same financial status. Not everyone has the same financial status. If you listen in the world, almost at any given time, there will be someone somewhere who has the problem of financial disparity on their lips. Almost someplace in the world, at any given time, someone is trying to solve this problem, the problem, the difference between the haves and the have-nots. It would be an interesting study to find out how many wars have been started with this end supposedly as the end goal, is to make everybody financially equal. Is that not supposed to be the aim of communism and socialism? In fact, the Christians of the first century fell into this same trap. They tried this. Right off the bat, in the book of Acts chapter number 4, they tried living in financial equality, and everybody just had one pool. And they tried this for a, a while, and then what happened? Acts chapter number 5, that's what happened, which is Ananias and Sapphira. That's what happened. And they found out, this doesn't work, because humans bring their heart into this thing. And here's Ananias and Sapphira trying to steal from the treasury and make all this happen. And so they dropped the, the, the uh, that attempt was abandoned. In fact, all the attempts in history that you find to try to make financial equality, have the results of that have been short-lived. Communism and socialism never end up in equality. What it does is it puts different people at the top and different people at the bottom, but it doesn't ever end up in financial equality. In the scene that we're looking at, even under the boot of Rome, 
which you'd have thought would have made everybody poverty stricken, even under that boot, the Jews found themselves in various financial positions. Some were very rich and others were very poor. There is no such thing as financial equality. Not everybody has the same financial status. Number two, financial position is not an indicator of spirituality. Your financial position is not an indicator of your spirituality. The health and wealth preachers would have us believe that closeness to God brings wealth. That's what they'd have us believe. Who gets wealthy in health and wealth preaching? The preachers, okay? That's the only people who get wealthy in health and wealth preaching are the preachers. This story makes it very plain here that love for the Lord is not the determining factor of what's in your wallet. Now, it is true. When God's people have equal opportunity, and they don't always, but when God's people have equal opportunity, what you'll find is that God's people get jobs, they produce something that society needs, they pay their own way, they pay their bills, and they produce. And all things being equal, they will live above the average because they are more, they use their money to, to wiser purposes. That's the way it is. God's people will, if all things being equal, will feed themselves. But financial position is not an indicator of spirituality. Number three, giving can be done for show. Giving can be done for show. Now, I'm not going to evil surmise against these men. Evil surmising is when you put motives to people that aren't there, that you don't know for sure. It's, it's reading into a situation, and we do this all the time. Be careful of this. It's probably the number one sin of God's people is evil surmising. Do not let yourself fall into that, attributing motives and thoughts to, and words to people that they never said or that you're not sure of. We won't attribute evil surmising against these rich men that were casting their gifts into the treasury. The, tre the, the passage does not say that they were making a big show of it although it would not be very hard to imagine what was taking place. But we also know that the widow put in her two mites, and so all this is being shown. And so we cannot say that these guys were making a show of it. But it is a very common thing for giving to be done with a show to it. I think I told you uh, when the church was starting Faith Promise, I was given the task of kind of putting that together. And so I ordered a whole bunch of books on Faith Promise. And one of the things that one of the books, maybe more of the books, uh, wanted us, was recommending that we do is on the, night of the day when we collected the Faith Promise cards, that we were supposed to set some kind of an adding machine up here in the front and have people bring their cards down and we'd have to hey, hey, and make a big show of that. You know what happened to that idea? right in the garbage can, okay? People do make a big show out of giving, but that is not the way this works. I've heard of men who, the church is having a building project, not this church, but a church is having a building project or some big project like that, and so they wait until the last minute. And then when it doesn't look like they're going to be able to make the goal, then this person walks in and gives a check to cover the whole thing, everything that's left. Giving can be done with a show. I'm assuming that these men were either putting the coins in, in, lar in a bag, and so, you know, you throw it in there and you hear this clunk, clunk, or they're dumping the coins out and you hear this continual ching, 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 and then you hear the, two, the lady, the widow, with her two mites go clink, clink. I'm sure that the sound was definitely different between what they were giving, the large sound, and her tiny sound. I do not know that any of them were giving for show, but it is possible that giving can be done for show. Number four, the Lord knows who gives what. The Lord knows who gives what. Our giving system here at this church the, the giving is very confidential. You give in the offering plate, the deacons take it downstairs, the deacons count it. Levi Luco records it for the amount for tax purposes, and that's it. 
I see on when I get to my office on Tuesday, I see the total amounts that were given. I see the designated money, but no names are ever attached to any of that. I see the, the generic total amounts. That's all that I know. The only person in this church that I know who gives what is myself. That's the only giving that I know. It's not how it is everywhere, but it's the way that it is here, and I think it's a very good way. I suppose that if people knew what everybody else was giving, I suppose if we printed your name in the bulletin with your amount next to it, I'm guessing that giving might go up if we would do that. But it would be very short term. You can shame people into giving or promote them into giving. But if the fact that God knows what you're giving isn't enough to motivate you, then anything else we would do would be very short-lived. God knows what you're giving. Nobody else might know, but he does. And I don't say that as a shaming kind of way. I say that as an encouraging kind of way. I don't know what anybody gives here but I do see the total numbers. And I know from the total numbers, I know that our, our regular giving is here and our faith promise is now about there. And what does that tell me? Many of God's people in this church are giving sacrificially. We don't put your name up on the board. We don't give, sell bricks on the side of the thing with your name on it or plaques we put on everything in the whole pro property. But God knows what you're giving. He knows when you sacrificially give. He knows that. He's not neglecting that. He's not overlooking that fact. Nobody else may know, but God himself knows exactly what you give. We try to not ever do any kind of giving for show or for fanfare here, but we do trust that God knows exactly what we give. Number five, God measures giving by what you have left, not by how much you gave. God measures giving by what you have left, not by how much you gave. One of the reasons that this story is such an attention getter, and because it opens up a whole new avenue of not of uncommon thinking to us. This whole thought process is different. Couple, two or three weeks ago, Carol and I went out west uh, of Iowa to Omaha. We went to the Omaha Zoo. And in several of the buildings that we went into, when you walk in, there would be this big plaque. And on the plaque, there would be $10,000 givers. And there was a whole bunch of them. And then there was a lower section. These are the $5,000 givers. And then there's a lower section. These are the $1,000 givers. I didn't see anybody's name on it that I knew. <laughs> and, the, and the 10 buck givers, I, <laughs> I, mine wasn't on there. This we understand, right? We understand $10,000. We understand $5,000. We understand $1,000. We understand these, this kind of giving. And these people are up here. We understand that. What this plaque does not tell us is anything more than the number that they gave. We do not know whether the guy who had the $10,000 had $50 million in the bank. And he gave that $10,000 and didn't even miss it. He didn't even know that it wasn't in his account anymore. He's got so much money. Maybe the person with the $1,000 gift actually gave up their family vacation or actually gave up something that they really wanted in order to give that money to the zoo. The plaques don't tell us this because all we know is the amounts, and so, wow, 10,000, 5,000, 1,000. That's how our thinking goes, but this is not how God measures things. God measures by what you have left, not what is given. These rich men threw in their weighty bags of coins. Now, the scripture says... From their abundance. What does that mean? It means that this that they threw in, although it was a significant amount of money, 
in comparison to all the rest of the money they had, wasn't anything. It was a, such a small percentage of what they actually had that it was hardly even countable in that realm. On the other hand, this widow gives two almost worthless coins. But in the giving of these two almost worthless coins, she gave everything that she had. Her food money, if that was her, that was her food money, and it was meager to begin with, but now she had no food money. And God judged that a greater gift, not from what each gave, but from what each had left. Hers was the greater gift, because God judges not by how much you give, but by how much you have left in your wallet. Number five. Number six, love is the proper motivation for giving. Love is the proper motivation for giving. You ever go to a garage sale? And there's a little girl there selling lemonade. It's overpriced, and you're not even thirsty. But it is, it's not even fair to do to garage sale people. Because what are they supposed to do but buy this lemonade from this poor little girl who says, do you want some lemonade? And you walk by her, no. Then when you walk back, she says, you want some lemonade now? <laughs> it's not even fair. And even a Dutchman can be conjoled into giving a dollar for a glass of lemonade uh, in situations like that. In a good cause, we can be convinced to give money we would not give. Even if there's enough recognition, even in a cause we don't even care about, we'll give money if there's enough recognition to be had with it. But ask yourself, what would cause a woman who is a widow to give her last two cents? What would cause her to give that money? You think that would cause, she, the, guy, the rich guys over there are going to pat her on the back or praise her? Would that be enough to give her the reason to give those two pennies? There is only one thing that would motivate that kind of giving. And that's love. She gave because of love. Love is the proper motivation for giving. This woman loved the Lord and wanted her giving to express that. Now there's actually a lot of verses that we could to branch off to here that would teach this. But just think of this widow. Think of her empty purse. Think of the love that motivated her to give. And judge your own giving and your own love by that kind of giving. Think of what it took for that woman to do that. Think of the love that would have to be there. Then think of your giving and think of your love for the Lord and you can measure it kind of in that way. Now, as a side note here, this is one of the reasons I love Faith Promise. Because if I were to make that kind of statement, what I just made, as a televangelist, everybody could sit out and say, oh yeah, that's a self-serving statement. Tell us to give like that, and love, increase our love, da, 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 because your salary is getting paid by this, and the more money you bring in, the more money you're going to get. One of the reasons I love Faith Promise is because the kind of money we're talking about is money on above and beyond the, the tithe. And all that money, most of the money, typically the where that money goes is into the Faith Promise program, which is strictly for missions. Has nothing to do with anything here. It all goes out to missions. And so I can say these kinds of things knowing that none of this money would ever, if you would start giving like this, none of it would ever come to me. It would not affect me in the least. It would all go out to the gospel being spread. But think about your giving, think about your love in relationship with this woman and her love and her giving. Love is the proper motivating factor. Number seven, faith is the determining factor. Faith 
is the determining factor. Love is the motivating factor. Faith is the determining factor. How do you suppose this widow was able to give her last two cents? Try to put yourself in her position. This is all the food money she's got. How does she, how is she able to do this? And the answer to that question is she believed God. She knew that she had to eat. She knew that God knew she had to eat. And she knew that God never forsakes those that trust him. She believed God. If you ever read Hudson Taylor's two volumes, he tells a similar story before he ever went to China. It's one of his most well-known stories. He got called, he, he was living in London, he got called to a house. The people were literally starving to death. The mother was just about dead, and if they didn't have food that night, she was not going to make it. So they call, and there's a whole bunch of kids there. Hudson Taylor gets called to this house. You know, I can't, I don't, British money, it doesn't work in my world, so I'll just change the numbers to American money and just make them up. Anyway, he had what we'll call a $5 bill in his pocket. And the man says, can you not help us? We're, you can see how bad, bad a shape we're in. And Hudson Taylor, knowing all he's got is a $5 bill in his pocket and there's no way to make change, he says, he says to the Lord, if I just had him in ones, I'd give him a buck here to help him out. And they keep going and talking and talking. He says, you know, Lord, if I had, two, if I had ones, I'd give him two bucks. And later he says, Lord, if, I, if it wasn't in a $5 bill, I'd give him $3. And I'd just keep the two for myself. It's all the money he had in the world. He eventually says, Lord, I'd give him four bucks, but it's in a $5 bill. If I just had it broken, I'd give him four bucks. Lord, I'd only keep 50 cents. I'd give him four fifty <laughs> if I just had it. What he said was, I was willing to trust God and 50 cents. Get your mind to wrap around that statement. I was willing to trust God and 50 cents. And he's eventually, he said, I tried, he actually had to pray for him. He said, I tried to pray and I couldn't pray for beans. He loved to pray, but I couldn't pray for beans because he was fighting with the Lord on this thing. And he says, then my heart broke and I gave him the last coin, the only coin I had, the last coin of all the money I had. And he said, the peace flooded back in my heart. And he said, then I reminded the Lord, you know, Lord, I got to eat tomorrow. I got something for breakfast, but I don't have anything for lunch. And so <laughs> I gave this, loaned this money out for you, but you're going to have to bring it back real quick. And sure enough, the Lord did. It was those kind of things that allowed Hudson Taylor to go to China without support. It allowed him to, to work with a thousand missionaries without support. The faith is the motivating factor. They believed God. This widow believed that God would bring the money and take care of her. Now, I want you to stop after I said that, and I want you to hear me very, very well at this moment. Because I do not want anybody to make an error or accuse me or attribute something that I did not say here. When I was in college, they used to use this story and several others like it to convince the college students to help support some of the things that were taking place, some of their renting some buses to get kids to Sunday school and those kinds of things. And so they would tell the guys, you know, look, you need to trust God. You need to trust God. And so you need to give your school bill, your money that's supposed to go on your school bill, you could give that money. You could trust God because like the widow did with her two mites. Or you can, some of the guys would give their rent money. They'd give their school bill in order to meet these needs. And you know what happened? Next thing you know, they're out of school or they're out of their apartment because they spent, they gave the money. This was not faith, that was foolishness. Yes. Okay, now let's divide the line here. One, the motivating factor was not love. The motivating factor was this. Okay, so motiv the fact that love is always the motivating factor. But hear me well, you cannot give $50 on $5 faith. It can't be done. 
so don't do it. You can't give $50 on $5 faith. So what's the point here? The point is to move forward from where you are right now. Your faith is what it is at this moment. So work to increase it. You're not going to have $50 faith tomorrow, but you could have $6 faith or maybe $10 faith. And then you work from that level. And you learn to trust God for the $10. And okay, all right, Lord, I'm, I can trust you for the Now I'm going to see, Lord, can I step out and go to $15 or $20 faith? You know, I'm just making these numbers up here, but you understand what I'm saying. You increase your faith one step at a time to try to say, well, the widow, she gave her a whole amount, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to throw my paycheck in the offering plate. Is not faith, it's foolishness. Because you don't have that kind of faith at this moment, I'm guessing. But what faith you do have, you can move forward with. What faith you do have, you can increase. You can let the Lord increase your faith. Money is a great faith-building tool. It's easy to add and subtract, and it's easy to chart. You can watch your faith grow in measurable ways. You can watch what the Lord does, and it causes your faith to grow. This is one of the other reasons why I really love Faith Promise. Because many of you in here have been in Faith Promise since the day one. And over the last 20 years, you've watched your faith increase. You said, the first time you gave Faith Promise, boy, I'm scared. Well, that's an easy number now, isn't it? When you look back after 20 years, you say, that was child's play. Now you look at the number that you're trusting the Lord for, you say, this is a little, little shaky here. It's on the outside edge of my faith. Why? Because your faith has grown from this $5 faith to $10 faith, $20 faith. It just continues to grow. And that faith that you learn to, to, that you learn to trust God in in money, which is a measurable thing, is the same faith that you trust him in in every other part of your life. And so your faith in God grows as you watch him work. Money is a wonderful tool for building your faith. The church is doing well financially. It's not what this is about. What it is about is your growth in the Lord. This is one of those areas that God can really use in your life to move you forward in your trusting ability. Instead of holding in, let yourself be moved forward. Let your faith grow until finally you'll have enough faith to give two cents. Let's pray.